Thank you so much for watching Landom Sea Goes There. Please subscribe and hit the like button and the bell notification button. Bad Day at Black Rock is a 1955 film directed by John Sturgis with a screenplay done by Millard Kaufman. It stars Spencer Tracy and Robert Ryan in the lead roles with a supporting cast of Ann Francis, Dean Jagger, Walter Brennan, John Erickson, Ernest Borgnine, and Lee Marvin. The movie is a crime drama that's set in 1945 that contains elements of a revisionist Western genre. It's originally based on a short story that was called Bad Time at Honda by Howard Breslin, and it was published in the American Magazine in January of 1947. Filming for the project began in July of 1954, and the movie went on to national release in January of 1955. It was a box office success and was nominated for three Academy Awards in 1956. The storyline goes that from the time that John J. McCready steps off the train in Black Rock, he feels a chill from all the residents in the town. The place is only a speck on the map, and few strangers ever come to it. McCready himself is tight-lipped about the purpose for his trip. He finds that the hotel refuses him a room, and the local garage refuses to rent him a car. And then he finds out the sheriff is a useless drunkard. It becomes apparent to him that the locals have something to hide. But when he finally tells them that he's there to speak to a Japanese-American farmer named Komodo, he touches a nerve so sensitive that he will spend the next 24 hours fighting for his life. The production decided to build the town set and to shoot on location at Lone Pine, California, one of the most used locations for westerns and other pictures throughout film history. This area is at the foot of Mount Whitney, on the eastern slope of the Sierra Nevadas. It was deemed suitable for this project because of its remoteness and the fact that it had an unused stretch of track that was once connected to the city of Los Angeles. This ended up being a must for the opening and closing sequences featuring the arrival and the departure of the Streamliner. The opening sequence showing the train originally was planned to have the train hurtling toward the audience almost like a 3D movie, but they then decided that it would be too deadly to attempt a helicopter maneuver into the path of a speeding locomotive. Stunt flyer Paul Mance offered the perfect solution. Have the train running backwards, fly the copter over the retreating engine, then project that footage in reverse. This shot turns out to be an amazing special effect. But the primary director, John Sturgis, can't take credit for it. He had already moved on to his next film, which was The Scarlet Coat. And Herman Hoffman took charge of filming this opening sequence. It's also kind of interesting that the popularity of this movie is in some of the most powerful areas of the world. The projectionist records have revealed that over the years, this has become one of the most frequently shown films in the White House's screening room. 54-year-old Spencer Tracy was widely felt too old to play a World War II veteran, especially because the film was set in 1945, when the war had just ended. But he does an amazing job in it. He's really fun to watch. The suit that he wears throughout the film was purchased by him off the rack at a second-hand store. The director, Sturgis, had scheduled an entire day for the scene in which McCready tries to find out from Smith what happened to the Japanese farmer. Spencer Tracy and Robert Ryan were so good and such accomplished professionals that the shooting was completed by nine that morning. 
an amazed director called for a print and started to move to another setup. But Spencer Tracy stopped him, insisting that the schedule called only for one scene that day, and he and Robert Ryan took off, forcing the director to try to shoot around Tracy, who was in nearly every scene. The original script did not call for the lead actor to be a one-armed man. The producers were so keen to get Tracy for this role that they changed the character somewhat because they didn't think Tracy would be interested in the original script. They knew that if they gave the character a weird disability, no actor can resist playing a character with a physical impairment. So he signed up to do the project. During the entire film, he keeps his missing hand in his suit coat pocket. Even in the fight scenes, he never takes it out. Just before shooting began, the indecisive Tracy tried to completely back out of the picture. He was weighed down by his growing alcoholism and just flat out didn't want to do it. An MGM executive contacted him shortly before filming began and told him not to worry about it. If he didn't want to do it, that was fine. They were going to send the script over to Alan Ladd and see if he wanted to do it. That was all it took. He didn't want Ladd taking his spot, so he agreed to do the film. Although he got along with most of the cast, Tracy could be moody and would give other actors the cold shoulder for days over some slight, real or imagined, incident that occurred. At one point, Anne Francis and Robert Ryan borrowed his car to go get burgers. The next morning, Tracy complained that his car was parked crookedly. Miss Francis got the silent treatment because of this. He didn't act that way to Robert Ryan, probably because he was such a star. The other reason that he was so hard on Francis was that he suspected that she was having an affair with Ryan. And Francis got even with him, though, for giving her the silent treatment during the time where they were shooting the scene where she drives Tracy's character to Adobe Flats. She gunned the car and took a big road bump at full speed, almost dumping the co-star into the road. Despite this, he stayed firmly in character and never removed his unusable left hand from his pocket. She later said that Tracy became friendly with her again after this incident. Go back and take a look at this often overlooked film of the mid-50s. It's a good one. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.